الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين رحمة للعالمين أبي القاسم محمد وأهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لك الفداء يا غريب يا مظلوم يا شهيد بأرض كربلاء ثم السلام عليكم يا أهل الأزال الحسين مظلوم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أما بعد قد قال الله تعالى في كتاب الحكيم وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أوحى ربك إلى النحل أن يتخذ من الجبال بيوتا ومن الشجر ومما يعرشون ثم كل من كل الثمرات فاسلك سبل ربك ذللا يخرج من بطونها شراب مختلف ألوانها فيه شفاء في شفاء للناس إن في ذلك لآية لقوم يتفكرون صلوات على محمد We have been pursuing a specific topic during these nights that we are together. And we have identified one of the most universal concern in the human life. And that is the concern with living a life that is not only good for oneself at a given time, but good for the future to ponder about. Human beings leave legacies. In the history of humanity, and perhaps I can say in the history of creation, it is human beings who build civilizations. We don't know any civilization that is described as the civilization of the animal kingdom. But you and I are aware that the war of civilizations has been going on for many, many centuries. If you look at the history of Islam and the history of Christianity, they have been at odds for many, many centuries. Islam dumb and Christian dumb fought one another many wars and they continue to do so. Now, maybe in a very more dangerous way than they did before because of the availability of the new weaponry and the availability of the media as a major weapon against one another. Today you don't need arms and armaments to fight. You need cyberspace to fight. And cyberspace is not in control of anyone and everyone has some kind of a role to spread information and misinformation. 
But my topic is more pertinent to your and my spiritual and moral development. I'm not simply concerned about academic fine points. I don't want to speculate about what the politicians are about to do. Or what the politicians mean when they say this thing and when they say that thing. That's not, I'm not a political analyst in any way. I don't even know what theories are operative. In order for me to understand the politics of any nation today, I find political world is hypocritical. It is not truthful to its citizenry. Citizens are taken for a ride in the most vibrant democracy that you can imagine on earth. Even liberal democracy has not been able to assert and give the rights that you and I expect that they would do. Hence, we are turning over to a different kind of collective organizations. I'm more interested in small organizations like ours. What kind of programs can have a major impact around other communities? We are no more isolated community. We are part of the concentric circles which connect us with other communities. In our vision, in what we expect those communities to do for us and for us to do for them, in both ways. So when I look at the Quran, I get this metaphor of civilization. Which civilization can succeed to provide with the directives, with indicators that can lead to the betterment of humanity? I'm talking about betterment of humanity. Because that's the vision the Quran provides me. And I'll talk about it a little more today. That the guidance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing in the Quran is of two kinds. There is one kind in which the text plays a dominant role. And I mentioned that that's the Quran or that's the Sunnah, whatever we are somehow raising to the level of our expectation of the sacred inspiring text. But then there are also examples Without the Prophet Sallallahu or without the early community, you and I cannot understand what the Qur'an is trying to do. The Qur'an is not operating in abstract environment. One of the things about the Qur'an is that it is founded upon moral realism. By that I mean when the occasions occur, when things happen, the Qur'an is searching to give us response for it. It wants us to be guided in the concrete terms. It doesn't want to leave us speculating about the possible solution to our problems. If poverty is a big, big problem faced by the humanity, then the Qur'an made it quite clear that you can never reach God through prayers only. But you will have to somehow think of your social responsibility. Aqeemu salat wa atu zakat. Two obligations are intertwined. You can't say I will perform only salat and forget about zakat. And you can't say I will simply help out in zakat and not perform the salah. The difference is this. If you fail to perform the salah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reserves the right to forgive you because that was his right to be worshipped by you. Listen to me carefully. But if you forget zakat, then each poor person has a right 
to hold you responsible for having failed in your obligation to help. Do you understand the two? There is haqqullah and there is haqqul ibad. If you don't perform the salat, if you don't forget, if you don't sit in worship of God, then God is ghafoorun rahim, can forgive you, can overlook your problems of not being able to worship Him. But if you fail to look, take care of those who are deprived in the society, those who need your help, then you are in trouble. Because they, then another human being is on your neck and asking you to provide a justification. Why didn't you help? You had the means to help. How come you did not help? What I'm driving at is civilization is based on the sweetness of honey that can cure the diseases of humanity. That's what the ayah is trying to tell us. Human beings, you need to move in different parts of the world. You need to make your homes in the most difficult areas of the world. Don't shy away from areas that don't have enough water to live there. And human beings have done it. They have lived in the most torturing and tormenting environment. And they have survived. In other words, they have learned to adjust. What Darwin would have said, this is what we call the secret of survival. The human beings adjust themselves to the conditions in which they should survive. But what is needed is you need the honey with you to cure the diseases you are faced with. Sometimes the diseases are psychological, sometimes they are social, sometimes they are biological. And all these must be taken care of. And this is what the eye is trying to tell us. Though so far we have reached this point. Our next point to ponder is, the last here, the last line about the Quranic injunction is this. People are intelligent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a dignity and saying that, you are laqad karramna bani adam. We have given you karama. We have given you an honor. We have given you the ability to think. And we have given you the ability to choose the right from the wrong. That ability is partly given to us so that we can reach the truth. All these nights I have been telling you there is a truth available in all religions, by the way. All religions have what we call a grain of truth in them. Through history they have covered it up. Through history we have lost touch with the truth. Our search is for the truth and what I'm suggesting is not only do we search for the truth carefully and with good intention but also apply it. Where do we apply it is the question. <clears throat> Yesterday we reached this point. Your life and my life is important for us to consider. We need to ask ourselves what kind of life you and I are about to live or are living or will continue to live. Because we have been given all the requirements of living a good life. Let me make it quite clear. Even material poverty does not take away from you your dignity. Even material poverty does not take away your ability to think. Quite to the contrary, you might continue to think even more clearly and with clarity to understand your goals if you are deprived of other things. There are so many people that I come across in my education, in my, in my you know, teaching students who come from the poor family and who are sharp. They have sharp wit and they have brilliance 
in what they do. In other words, material well-being is not a condition for well-thinking. I also mentioned quite clearly that we are here to discover the paradigm that Karbala provides. So far, you and I have been talking about the rituals of Karbala. So far, our emphasis has been on maintaining the rituals of Karbala. We have not considered Karbala as a source of example that can be applied today in modern times. Is that correct? Because for us, the goal is very different. The goal for us is to succeed materially. When material well-being is guaranteed, we forget that there is another dimension to my well-being. And I introduced last night in the lecture the idea of لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا in the life of the Prophet وسلم, you have a perfect paradigm. Now, Uswatun Hasana, by the way, Uswa is a pattern of life. With the guarantee that you can follow, all human beings can follow it. It's not only the prophets who live like that. I want to assure you that you don't have to be a saint to live that life. Any ordinary person has access to that paradigm of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Please recite the salawat and zikr Muhammad sallallahu Perfection of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is dependent upon our ability to retrieve the humanhood of the Prophet Muhammad. I wanted something unusual, humanhood. I'm a human being like you. And the Prophet has been reported to have been worried even about his own destiny in the Quran. Read the Quran carefully. And the Prophet says, I don't have hidden knowledge. If I had hidden knowledge, I would have been sure about my future. I don't know about my future. Wallah, wallah, this is in the Quran. He says quite clearly, the Prophet is made to say by God, tell them. Because the Meccans were saying, how come God did not send these angels for us? How come God did not send one of these big shots in Makkah as our guide? Rajulun Awain, because for them, having a great man was being wealthy, being influential, and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was an orphan, recognized by Khadija through marriage, that this young man is talented, he can go and do the trade on my behalf, and he will deliver what I entrusted to him as my trustee. See, see the way Khadija is operating, salam alayha. She recognizes Muhammad by seeing the very fact that he has built a reputation in the society already, in the tribal culture, as Amin and as Sadiq, as trustworthy and truthful. And these are the two things you need business. Yes, my friends, you need these two in business. You can't cheat people and get away with it. Business life must be kept clear. No cheating, because that is the 70, 70 parts of your faith is lawful earning. That's what the Prophet said. 70 parts of your earning is lawful earning of your risk. If you miss on that issue, you are closing the gates of spiritual development. Remember this, I said it. You're closing the gates of moral development because you have given yourself habits of making money unlawfully. 
That means you are putting the bread on your table that does not belong to you. It belongs to someone else. Na'uzubillah. No, remember, this, this, there are some of the key issues here. Following the exemplar must be understood simultaneously in terms of Muslims' aspiration. Let's ask ourselves, what kind of aspiration do we have today? And effort, what, are, what kind of effort are we putting into that? And what kind of ideas are we applying to ourselves to bring our life closer to Uswatun Hasana? Because Uswa means practicable pattern. It's not a difficult pattern. You know, Sufis sometimes talk about Uruj, they talk about, you know, getting to the Fana and Baka and all these things. It's very elitist. You have to be an elite of some sort. Spiritually, you have to be so special in order to climb that ladder of perfection. Here the Prophet says, Ana basharun mathlukum. Giving the confidence to us that, look, I'm a human being like you. In whom, except that I do receive revelation. And unless I'm informed about certain things, you might not be, you know, privileged to it. But otherwise, essentially, I'm like you. That means you can put into practice what I'm saying. Don't ever say, oh, he was a prophet. And we are, you know, ordinary human beings. No, the prophet says, I'm ordinary human being. If you're asking me, what do I know about him? The Meccans used to say, how come he doesn't bring the treasures from the skies? This is in the Quran, by the way. How come he doesn't let the money fall down? And the Prophet says, that's not my function. That's not me. I'm going to give you the message. And I'll teach you and I'll leave for you a pattern that you can follow as human beings. If I do this, then I'll, have, I'll be in a different state of existence. And the Quran is helping the Prophet by saying that, tell them. If there were angels living on this earth, we would have sent a Prophet who was an angel. Since you are human beings, I will send a human being like yourself. So that you can look at him and say, yes, I can become Khadija. I can become Rukhaya. I can become so and so. What is being, I think, generated here is the confidence. Look at the last item here. And I'm talking about a need to align the cap capacity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in you and me a capacity. An ability to do what we can do. Istata'a. Quwa. Irada. All of these terms are part of that. We have to align it. And let me explain just a little bit that. What does it mean to align capacity with virtuosity? It is to put in such a position that your capacity begins to respond to what you need to do. If you don't have a capacity to, to lift 150 pounds in the weights, then you can't reach 150 pounds. Your capacity determines how much weight you can bear, right? That's what you do in the gym. Here you're also talking about the spiritual muscles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. The spiritual ability. This is surprising. Be, weren't you surprised? Last night when I spoke about Qasim ibn al-Hassan, that this young boy of 13 years of old age was willing to go and die in the path that Imam Hussain was describing. 13-year-old boy willing to die requires a lot of inner strength. And you see, it's not that you don't see it. You see people are getting killed in the, in, the, in the battlefield. He's not the last, he's not the first one to go who has seen nothing. He sees Ali Akbar is being killed, being brought in blood. He sees only Muhammad being killed, being brought. Hor being killed and brought. All the companions and the family members 
are being killed. And yet, a 13, 14 year old boy has the courage to say, even I will go the same path. It requires the inner strength. This is, this is what I call the alignment. If you understand this is the purpose for which I have been sent in this world, then the alignment occurs. Let's move on. In order for that alignment to occur, between what I need to do in my life and the strength that God has given me to live that life, I need some kind of guidance. Aristotle would have said that you need to practice a virtue until it becomes a psychic power within you. And I mentioned that the more you do the virtue of sex, the more they become part of your personality. A personhood is developed by training yourself to carry out the requirements of becoming perfected. Let's also consider that what kind of availability is there for all human beings? This is what I said last night, that there is a concept of human dignity in Islam. Most of our Muslim scholars, most of our Muslim scholars, both Sunni scholars and the Shia scholars have insisted that dignity belongs only to Mu'minin. Listen to this carefully. You cannot have dignity that you are talking about unless you have faith. That would remove so many people from having a possession of dignity and the respect that should be owed to them. Amma Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, we find that in his instructions to Malik bin Ashtar when he was being sent to Egypt, made it quite clear that you cannot deprive anybody of their dignity. You remember the sentence, famous sentence of Imam Ali? When he sent Malik bin Ashtar, he said, you are going to Egypt. All of them are not Muslims. Majority are non-Muslims. And they don't share your faith with you. How are you going to treat them? Are you going to be a cruel ruler, killing them and murdering them the way you want to do that? As my governor, I send you there. You are representing me. And I want you to know that for in the Homa Sin Fan, there are two kinds of people that you will be confronted with. Imma Akhun Lakafid Deen, or Imma Nawirun Lakafil Khalq. There will be those who are sharing your faith and they are part of your brother, brotherhood. And there are those who are human beings who are equal to you in creation. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It's amazing. The cognition of universalism is amazing. An imam is not using faith as a point of distinction. You don't need that faith in order to qualify as a member of human community. Keep that in mind when you talk about kufr, when you do takfir, by the way. Jihadists at the moment are doing takfir. ISIS is doing takfir. And the takfir is based on this idea that anybody who is not a member of my community is legitimate victim of my sword or my gun. I can kill him or her. Not only that, in the treatment of Yazidi women, for example, we see the violation of not only human rights, but the violation of the Quran itself. The violation of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How can that be possible? That I can kill another woman, I can rape another woman because she happens to be non-Muslim. What kind of mindset would do that? Here you need an example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not enough to have the words, it's not enough to have the text. You know what I'm driving at is that you can't quote the Quran wherever you find them, kill them. This is the Surah Tawbah. 
Iron them before they fire. Wherever you find them, kill them. You can open that verse and say, all right, there is a justification for me to kill anybody who doesn't believe in Islam. Amir al-Mu'mineen is aware of this cruelty that can come out of the tribal mentality. Listen to me carefully. This is the tribal mentality. This is a clannish view. That clannish view is also dominating in the sectarian relationship in the community, by the way. The way we talk about the Sunnis, the way Sunnis talk about Shia, that's clannish, that's tribal, there's nothing Islamic about it. Because Islam would require us to consider with dignity, the dignity of another person. Most of the scholars, I was reading Adalat al Ijtimaiya, a book written by Sayyid Qutb. You read that book. He makes quite clear the only person who are immune, who, are, who deserve to be respected by us, Muslims, are Muslims. So what happens to the non-Muslims? What if the Muslims are declared to be non-Muslims? Like they say Shia or Humul Kuffar, Ha'ul Al Kuffar. So kill them wherever you find them. That's the justification by the way. I was pleased, very much pleased in Iraq. When we were there talking to the people, listen to this very carefully. When somebody has done wrong to you, you have a psychology of hatred within you. I must tell you that. When somebody has treated you badly, you want to take a revenge by treating that person badly. Tit for tat. This is known as retributive justice. You treated me bad, I will take the retribution and I'll treat you the same way. To my very pleasant surprise and to my astonishment, when I used to talk to the Shia in Iraq about having lost their dear ones, I heard almost through a consensus of many families that you would talk to that they did not want revenge from the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They didn't want to kill the Sunnis. The Sunnis had destroyed them. They were a minority that was empowered by the by Saddam government. They were not only Ba'athis, they were tribal leaders for the, from Al Ambar province. And they killed, and killed, and killed. They are now finding mass graves <coughs> outside Najaf, outside Kufa, where and where not. These were the Shias who were just wiped out. I was expecting, I was expecting a revengeful mindset that the Shia would say, we want to kill them now that we have the power. Democratically, we are the elected government, we'll get rid of them. I did not hear that. Families would describe, there was our neighbor woman who was described in that, they put my father in front of our eyes, in the ground, and tore him and killed him in front of our eyes. We were all looking. And we could not say anything. Don't you entertain any kind of anger? Sallallahu Allah. Allah wakil. Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. You remember this? Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal nasir. I was pleasantly surprised that, and I kept on asking, how could this be possible? You know what is happening in Palestine and Israel? What's happening is a kind of a Semitic anthropology playing out revenge after revenge, which leads to endless retribution and endless violence against one another. Look at the history, present history of Israel. They kill us, we'll kill them, we'll take aeroplanes and, and throw bombs at them. The way they destroyed Gaza, the way they destroyed places, they, will, they destroyed innocent people. Now, on both sides, there is an unending violence. I thought that this would be the scene in Iraq. These Shias would want to kill the Sunnis. No 
would get rid of them as they did the same thing to them. And to my surprise, when I am I'm told that Ayatollah Sistani said, Ha'ula min anfusina. He didn't say, Ha'ula ikhwanuna. He didn't say they're our brothers. He said, no, Ha'ula Sunnah wa Jama'ah, they are from ourselves. They belong to us, we belong to them. That's what it means. In other words, there is already a vision that is being projected in the name of Ayatollah Sistani. That these people are our responsibility. We cannot destroy them. We cannot kill them. They will be protected by us. And it's true. Whatever killing that you find in Al-Ambahar province, in other parts of the Iraq, where the ISIS or where the Islamic State is killing Yazidis, Christians and Shias outright, there is no uproar in Iraq at the moment about that. That is what we call tolerance. And I, I told myself, if you become tolerant of immoralities, aren't you particip participating in immorality? When I don't say some, when I don't say this is wrong, when I see wrong, am I not participating in that wrong? Alamata Batabai in Al Mizan makes us aware that if wrong is done and if you don't say anything, you are part of the wrong. Nobody can protect you. Allah will ask you, where is your fitra? Where is your conscience? Imam Ali would say, where is your sarira? Where is your inner, inner, inner prophet? Why didn't you wake up? Why didn't you raise your voice? You are always submitting. You are always submitting to the wrongs done. What kind of human being are you? And Sheikh Sati would have said, بَنِ آدَمْ آزَاءِ يَكْ دِگَرَنْ چُنْ اُزْوِ بَدَرْ آيَدْ اُزْوِ دِگَرِ رَنَ مَالَدْ قَرَارْ بَنِ آدَمْ are part of one another, it's part of one body. If one part of the body is hurt, the whole body is in pain. How can you and I be indifferent? Or oh, what does it matter? I remember during Saddam's time, I was adamant not to visit Iraq because I thought that by my going to Iraq, I was supporting Iraq, Saddam's Iraq. Also, I was made aware, if you don't go, there are people who are depending on you spending the money so that they can earn something out of you. You are depriving them, you are punishing Saddam, but you are also punishing the innocent in between. So you have this rethinking going on. This is what we call a moral dilemma. Where do I stand in moral dilemma? What should I do? Infused virtues are universal virtues that you and I in any part of the world, when I speak about these matters in the classroom, by the way, my students are in all one voice supporting the thesis that I present to them that we cannot remain indifferent. These are not Muslims. They are ordinary students. But I touch their humanity. I say, your human essence cannot accept it. What Imam Hussein has done for you and me is that he has kept our conscience alive. Otherwise, my and your conscience are very easily destroyable. You and I would lose our compass very easily, our direction very easily, because we have no sense of the map. You remember one of the slides I used before, I said, you need a plan for your life. If you don't have a plan for your life, that means you cannot do things the way it should be done. My brothers and sisters, we have not come in this world to live forever. There are warnings, people die in front of eyes, our eyes, young and old die. And it's a reminder, Kullu nafsin da'aqatul mawt. Oh, you're not going to live here permanently. Come on, wake up. That's the kind of voice our, our conscience is giving us. And this is what I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to convey here. A conceptual means for articulating the only God's guidance can direct us to our true final end. You need a belief in some hidden power. Ghaib, that is directing you, that is giving you. And by the way, your conscience is constantly talking to you. 
You don't have to be a Muslim to hear the conscience. You can be a human being and you will hear the conscience biting you when you do wrong. You don't have to be something special. What it does is that it's inspiring us with what it means to submit to the divine will. Ya Allah, I am submitted to you. I will do what you want me to do. Are you able to say that? We in the modern times are very smart. We think we, can, we don't have to submit to anyone. Part of the autonomy in the modern age is I don't have to depend on anyone. I am already autonomous individual. My mind is functioning very well. My rational abilities are telling me how to do things, how to manage things. I don't think there is anything wrong with that confidence. The only thing is that it is a different kind of idolatry. You are worshipping your own self. You are thinking that you are invincible. Nothing can happen to you. And then all of a sudden, you are in, in a situation of bedridden illness. God forbid, God forbid. You are moving, you are walking, you are going here and there. All of a sudden, there is a halt. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to do is that He is trying to say that there is a power to whom you have not submitted. I want to read Najul Balakh for a minute for you. I found this reference and I said, oh my God. Imam Ali knew about it. This Imam that you and I, be I believe in is demanding to be heard from us. My brothers and sisters, Open Najul Balagha and see what Imam is saying. You want to hear what he wants to say about us? Al Alimu Man Arafa Qadrahu Wakafabil Mar Mar Ijahlan Allah Yarifu Qadrahu. We are talking about our knowledge, about our end, our goals. If we don't know our ends, our goals, then we are in this situation that Imam is describing. The one who knows, knows what he should do at different times. Haven't you seen there are people who have insights in what they do? And they surprise you by taking the right action at the right time. They have not been misled by the wrong ideas, by the theories of conspiracies. Oh, I'm being controlled by CIA, I'm being controlled by so-and-so. And they forget that there's a higher power to control all of us. This is what Imam Ali is saying. The one who doesn't know his goals, what happens to him? He is unaware of the status that he is holding. And that status is very important. You and I remember all the time that I repeated several times, you and I are endowed with dignity, with the ability to respect ourselves, with the ability to know our own worth. A human being who doesn't know his own or her own worth does not even belong to the club of human beings. He is not a member of humanity. And this is what Imam is saying. Look at this sentence. وَإِنَّ مِنْ أَبْخَذِ الرِّجَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ لِي لَعَبْدًا وَكَّلَهُ اللَّهِ لَنَفْسِ Allahu Akbar The worst human being is the one to whom God says Go, do whatever you want to do You're not a member in my community You want to do it? You are insisting to do it? Do it وَكَّلَهُ بِنَفْسِ I give you up to go and do whatever you want to do. And then what happens? Oh, he was shown the path. He was told how to go. And he refused to follow the path. How many times you have regretted for not following the path? You get the indication. God loves you. This is what I call infused knowledge by God given to all human beings. Whether they are Hindu or Muslim or Jew, I don't know, atheist or anyone. As long as they are human beings, God has given them that knowledge. 
لان امام زيز شاعرا بغير دليل he is following his own you know whims without any good reason sometimes you have a reason sometimes you have a reason not to follow the indications that you are receiving and you say I will not follow that path Imam says in that case God leaves you to yourself and that's the worst thing Imam said Abidin in his dua several times he says Ya Allah don't leave me to my, to, on my own devices I will not be able to do anything إِنَّ الدُّوْيَا إِلَى الْحَرْثِ الدُّنْيَا عَمِلَا وَإِنَّ الدُّوْيَا إِلَى الْحَرْثِ الْآخِرَ كَسِلَا These are the people who run to do what things are needed to be done in their worldly affairs, but they are running away from doing things that the Akhira demands from them. They don't want to pay attention to it. Because they don't see it. You see the problem of having faith. If you don't have faith, you are not seeing your future clearly. When you have the faith, you know your future. When you go to the psychic readers, you go to the Thomist, you go to, you go to the astrologer, Joshi, in India, so that they can read your future. Imam Ali says, what you do today, you will earn tomorrow. Your future is what you do today, you will earn tomorrow. If you don't live the correct life, you will suffer tomorrow. Remember that. What I'm suggesting here is that when virtue is equally endowed to all of us as human beings, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is He doing? He is stopping anyone to claim superiority. Moral elitism is rejected by the very idea of alhamaha fujuraha wa taqwaha qad aflaha man zakkaha wa qad khaba man dassaha qad dhaba samudu bi taqwaha Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inspiring all of us equally and he says I make no difference among human beings like Imam Ali said if they are your brother in your faith okay but remember they are equal in creation with you so respect them for what they are as human beings. In other words, what we have is infused virtues do not require great intellectual capacity on the part of the agent. You and I have minimum understanding of what is right from wrong. And we know how to react to it. You can't make an excuse, Ya Allah, you never provided me with with enough information for me to think about it. No, God has given you enough information. Lying is wrong. Come on, accept it. That's what it is. Hypocrisy is damaging your faith. Stop being that all the time. Stop pretending what you are not. Stop deceiving others about it. Infused virtues are part of the universal guidance. Whereas acquired virtues are part of the prophetic guidance. The Quran is talking to us in two languages. There are two references, there are two states of the Quran. At one point it is talking to those who are accepting the Quran. At another point it says, even if you are a human being, you are still under my guidance. I won't abandon you. I brought you in this world, I am supposed to guide you and I will guide you. That's why we say, Ehdina Salat al Mustaqim. Don't we say that in Fatiha? I'm coming very close to my destination. What I am trying to do tonight is to inspire you with something that Imam Ali was worried about. Imam Ali was worried about Islam being empty of its proper teachings. Our inherited Islam is so faulty, by the way. The way you and, I, you and I have inherited Islam in different ways is so problematic sometimes. And the one thing that we have not been able to gauge is, what is missing? If somebody told you what is the most important aspect of Islamic teachings that you, can, that you would like to share with the world, what would you say?
If somebody put that question to you, you are claiming you are a Muslim, you are the best of the community, everything else, and keeping that in mind, I'm willing to listen to you. You tell me one attractive dimension of Islam that I would be convinced that you have found a way. If anything, I need to emulate you. What would that be? Again, I'm coming to Najwa Balaba, and Imam Ali is warning you and me. Please listen carefully to Najwa Balaba. Imam Ali had a vision. I, I don't want to attribute supernatural powers to Imam Ali. In my understanding of Imam Ali, Imam Ali is a perfect human being. Human being in essence. Who can teach us something about ourselves. And Imam Ali is warning you and me for the days to come, for the days that you and I are faced with. And how we play games. We play the games of words. We play the games of discourse to discredit what we have been taught. Because in modern times, you and I are empowered. We have the skills of language. We have the skills of rationality. We have the skills of autonomy. All those skills are helping you and me to become independent. But our independence is at a, is at a prize. And the prize is that we are cut off from the divine. We are cut off from the divine. That's what the modern life wants us to do. Modernity is based on killing the tradition that connects human beings to the proper way of living as taught by the great examples. You and I are in search of examples, whether it is Khadija al Kubra. Whether well, it is Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amman, Yasir, Sumayya, anybody that you can name in the early days of Islam. You and I are searching for their examples. We want to follow them. But what is stopping us from following them is the, the mystification of these individuals. I am trying to give you, and I, will, I, will, I am not hesitant at all to say this, that for me, Ali ibn Abi Talib is a human being first and then Baliullah. Are you with me? If you want to attach any importance to him, or Imam al-Muttaqeen is a function of Imam Ali. He is the guide of those who are guided in some ways. When he tells you and me something, can we ignore it? If we are true followers of Imam Ali, we will not ignore that. Especially when the Prophet ﷺ said, Al haqqu ma Ali wa Ali ma al haqq. Truth is with Ali and Ali is with the truth. This is not an exaggeration. <coughs> Final point before I come to my station. Ayyuhan Nas, listen carefully. Ayyuhan Nas. سَيَعَتِ عَلَيْكُمْ زَمَانٌ يُكْفَعُ فِيهِ الْإِسْلَامِ كَمَا يُكْفَعُ الْآنَاءُ بِمَا فِيهِ Did you get that, my sister? You didn't get the Arabic. I didn't get the Zaman. Okay. There will come a time. Look at the way Imam is looking at the future. سَيَعَتِ عَلَيْكُمْ زَمَانٌ a time will come for you. And look at the way he's putting it in a, in a metaphor of a utensil. A utensil in which you put water. Water which is your life-saving agent. You need water. You might do without food. You don't have to eat, but you have to drink water. And that's what Imam is using. It's like a pot full of water which has been overturned. All the water has gone and only the dampness has remained. What will happen? Who, what will happen? Who will suffer from this? Islam will suffer from emptiness of the content. You and I are faced with Islam without content. 
That's our major problem. We have lost the content of Islam. We have lost the honesty of Islam. We have lost the sincerity of Islam. Karbala is reviving exactly those elements. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have lost the content. My dear brothers and sisters, think for a moment. The Islam that you have with you, what does it have that makes you comfortable and confident that you have the right thing in your hand? Hold on to the rope of God and don't be divided. Don't be divided. Don't fight with one another. Don't do takfir of one another. Don't curse one another. Where has that gone? What has happened to us? Anybody who dis disagrees with us, curse them. Anybody who doesn't like us, curse them. That's what we do. Where is it? What is the content that we are talking about? Imam says there will come a time Islam will be empty of its content. If this was the time of Banu Maya, Imam Ali is talking about you and me having no Islam left for us except rituals. We are smart Muslims. Modern Muslims, wow, they are very special, autonomous, rational. Emotional Indian. Oh, emotional? No, 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 emotion is wrong. Don't cry. Crying is bad. It's not a good sign of a man to cry, right? <laughs> That's what we are taught. When Jimmy Carter used to drop tears, they would say, Americans would say, Oh, what a pressure, he is crying. He's a human being. Come on, wake up. He has feelings. He can feel the pain. Come on. If you feel the pain, then cry. Because that's a natural instinct in us. When you are in pain, you cry. You don't hold your tears back. But modernity says shedding tears is your weakness. And this is what the tribes used to say in the time of the Prophet. When Ibrahim died, Ibrahim, the son of the Prophet, died. He had several sons, by the way. They all died one after the other. Ibrahim died and the Prophet buried him and started crying. Like the moderns are saying, you men are crying. The Prophet says, God has given the eyes to shed the tears. Has given the heart to feel the pain and the suffering of the others as much as your own suffering. Where are you sleeping? Look at this tragedy of Muslims. Now crying is bidat. <laughs> we, we are told by our fellow Muslims that, oh, you have introduced bid'a. You're crying. Aisha, radiallahu anha, she went on her brother's grave. This is Bukhari, by the way. When her brother was killed, she was, she sat on the grave and crying. An Arab came and said, why are you doing it? The Prophet didn't say it. No, Aisha corrected him. Said, the Prophet didn't say you don't cry. You don't blame God for your suffering. That's what the Prophet said. Look at the way we have twisted religion. Are you with me when I'm saying, Imam Ali saying, Islam will be empty of the contents. There'll be nothing left in Islam. I am towards the end of my discourse tonight. If anything I have conveyed to you, God has infused our hearts with feelings. Show your feelings. Come on. Embrace someone you love. Hold the hand of someone you love. Stop this modern playground things. You can't touch, you can't do this, you can't do that. Because this is not appropriate. So you develop hypocritical behavior in front of the people. Hypocrisy is modern disease. 
and in the name of religion, even more than anything else. You should see the people who are religious. They are the embodiment of hypocrisy. Many of them I've seen. I'm talking about the world around me. Tonight, it's the night of my Mola. Yeah. Oh, you're saying your Mola, isn't it better? No, it is not better. Abul Fazl Abbas is my Mawla. If it was not Abul Fazl Abbas, I would not have reached this stage at all. I started preaching at the age of 11, 10, 11, 12, and I used to preach in Mehfli Abbas, in the mosque in Dar es Salaam early morning. 15 minutes majalis. That's what I used to do. I had no knowledge. I didn't know a word of Arabic. I didn't know, know a word of Urdu or a word of Farsi. No, nothing. Empty. There was only one thing that, thing that sustained me, the love of Arab babes. I love Arab babes. Abu Fazl al Abbas, I don't know what, how to start the description. I don't want to go too long. I know it is eighth night of the night of Baharam. And my spiritual mother came to my home in Charlottesville. She knocked the door. I opened the door and I saw her standing with the alam of Abu Fasl al Abbas. Ashhadu Allah, Ashhadu Allah, Muhammad al she asked me, do you know what night is it tonight? I said, no. It's the eighth night of Muharram. It's the night of Abu Fasl al-Abbas. This is Kusum by Ansari, my spiritual mother. She was standing with the alam. I said, please come in. And she came where we had, we had our dining table, but the alam was big. How did it fit? I don't know. This is the night of Abul Fazlul Abbas. Abul Fazlul Abbas. You want to hear him? On the Ashura night, when Imam Sen gave his speech, this is what Imam Sen said. On that night, this is what Imam Hussain said, فَقَالَ فِي خُطْبَتِهِ أَمَّا بَعْدْ فَإِنِّي لَا عَالَمُ أَصْحَابًا أَوْ فَعَلَى خَيْرٍ مِنْ أَصْحَابِي Look at the way Imam Hussain is recognizing his companions. I don't know anybody more faithful than the companions I have. Hmm? وَلَا أَهْلُ بَيْتِ أبر ولا أوصل من من أحل بيتي وهذا الليل قد خشيكم فاتخذوه جملا. This night is covering everything. Use it as a camel and go. That's what Imam is saying. And the first person to stand up and respond to the Imam is Abu Fazl Abbas. Look at what Abu Fazl Abbas. These are his words. Recorded in the history. This is what he said. فقال أبو الفضل الأباس ولم نفعل ذلك. We will not do what you are telling us to do. We will not do that. لنبقى بعدك لا أرانا الله ذلك أبدا. So that we live after you. Can you understand what Abu Fazl Abbas is going through? Abu Fazl Abbas is saying, I don't want to be in this world after you, Ya Abu Abdullah. Should I be just concerned about myself? Should I be the one like that? ثم تكلم أهل البيت. Everybody spoke. But you know, in the 9th of 8th of 
maybe seventh or eighth of Muharram, Abdullah al Kalabiya, Abu Fazl Abbas' maternal uncle, came with a letter of security, amnesty, I would say. And he told Abu Fazl, he called Abu Fazl Abbas. Imam Sunan was the one who said, Your uncle is here to see you. Go and see him. And they came, the brothers came, because Abu Fazl Abbas was not alone. He was with his brothers, three brothers. Himself, 34, 24, 19, and 17. Four brothers. All in Karbala. Look at this man, Abu Fazl Abbas. Now you know why Karbala is Karbala, because Abu Fazl Abbas is there. What is so peculiar about Abu Fazl Abbas? His faith. Ahle Wafa. His sense of loyalty to the mission of Imam Hussein. Do you understand what I'm trying to convey to you? I'm not here simply to make you cry. You can cry and I want to cry also. But I want you to be aware of the maqam, the station that Abu Fazl Abbas is holding. Abdullah bin Kalabiya, his uncle, comes and he says, We don't want this amnesty from Ibn Sumayya. This is Maui. This is Yazid. And he says, I don't want. We don't want this. Please go away. But on the night of Muharram, in the evening of the night of the Muharram, Shimr came. Shimr was connected in relationship with our first Abbas tribe. Kalabiyah. And he called upon, where are my sons, the sons of my sister? You know how hypocrisy shined. Where are the sons of my sister? Abu Fazl Abbas said to his brother, don't say anything. This is what I call practicing something, a virtue. But it would appear, why won't you do that? You are being called. Imam Hussein realizes that Yes, an Arif who was I know that he is a wicked person, but he has called you. Respond to him. Immediately, Abu Fazl Abbas comes there and he says, and he is coming there and he says, فَقَالَ لَهُ الْعَبَّاسِ لَعْنَكَ اللَّهُ وَلَعْنَ اللَّهُ لَعْنَ الْأَمَانَ Because he was talking about Aman, I brought this letter. You are immune, you can come with me, amnesty for all, all four of you. Now, what are you talking about? Curse of God be on you. That's what it, that's what it is. May God remove your, his mercy from you. Go away from here. I am telling you, if anybody of weak conscience was tested on those grounds, to save his life, he would have left him, I'm saying. <coughs> Saving your life. It's very, very tough to give up your life. We all know our life. Our father Abbas is now, you know, standing firmly. Imam Sen says, look at the way Imam Sen is addressing his brother. I am telling you these conversations are very authentic conversations that I have found in the history. Binafsikaya Abbas. May my life be sacrificed on you, Ya Abbas. Can you imagine Imam Zen? Imam al Waqt is telling Abbas, May my life be sacrificed for you, Abbas. Go and do this for me. What was it that Imam Zen wanted us to go and tell them, Give us one night. You want to fight? Give us one night. We want to spend the night in Ibadah. We want to spend the night in reading the Quran. Yes, brothers and sisters, how many times you open the Quran? Ask yourself. How many times you read the Quran? Ask yourself. Yeah, Imam said, in the most difficult circumstances, he says, <laughs> We like to do that. We like to read the Quran. We like to do this. We, we like to do istighfar. How many of us do istighfar in the daytime or any other time? 
Except ritually we do it between all the between the two sajda astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubna Allah akbar and we forget about the istighfar. Oh, we are perfect. Modern people are very perfect. They don't need God, they don't need anything. I will first the Abbas is being told by Imam saying, go and tell them to ask for this one night. We want to read the Quran. We want to do istighfar. Mola, you want to do istighfar? We, in this community, we believe that you are masoom. You don't need to do istighfar. You're already purified. Imam is setting the example for you and me that don't forget there are shortcomings that you have in your life. Ashura day came. I'm rum moving very fast now. And I come to this particular scene that I want to describe to you. Everybody has been killed by this time. <coughs> and by sure day, Imam Zen comes, Abul Fazl Abbas comes to Imam Zen, everybody has been killed. There's no one left. He stands in the front of, Ab of his brother, Imam Zen says, this is what he says, The conversation starts, I want to go now. I want to go and fight. Imam Hussain says, Anta sahib wilai, lawai. You are my alamdar. And here, Marhum Abdul Hussain Sharafuddin Musawi, who is writing this book, by the way, is telling us that Alam was given to the most strong individual, committed individual, who was strong in body and mind. He held the alam. And Imam Zen says, you are my commander. How can I let you go? Imam is looking at him. How was it Abbas? This is what it says. He's folding his hand in front of Imam Sen. Look at this soldier. He's folding his hand and says to Imam, Zaka Sadri, my, my chest is, is constrained. I'm feeling the pain. I can't stand it anymore. What is Zaka Sadri? So I don't like living anymore. Ya Abdullah, I don't like living anymore. I'm telling my Mawla Abul Fazl Abbas, Abul Fazl Abbas, you are known for your bravery. You are known for your shujaad. You are standing in front of your brother saying that I'm going to give up. Isn't your brother also feeling the pain? Isn't Imam Sen carrying the same burden that you have carried since morning on the Ashura day? But Hussein is Hussein. Abbas is Abbas. Hussein has the patience of mountains. Abbas is standing there and saying, you let me go now. You know what Imam Hussein does? Okay, you're going? Think about the water the children need. Can you imagine at the last moment? Imam says, you go, but think of the water. He comes in the khayma and talks to the to Sakina. This, uh, this soldier was so strange. He was so good with the children. Usually the army people are not that, you know, they are not known for their compassion. You know, he was Abbas in the tribal culture of Arabia in the 7th century. And he's, he loves children and says, Sakina, give me your water back. I'll get some water for you. Sakina is running. Can you imagine? She is running. She brings the water back. She said, take it. When she is preparing all those 52 children that I mentioned some nights ago, that there were so many children in there. <clears throat> My uncle is going to bring the water for us. You don't know what is thirst, by the way. You don't know what, is, what it means to be thirsty. Ask Sakina, how thirsty is this little girl? And I will first love Bas, is holding the alum, holding the water bag and going towards the river. By the way, he got to the river. He was so brave. It's amazing. 
The eighth night that I'm talking about, the night of Abu al Fazl Abbas, and my spiritual mother remind me, reminding me, this is the night of Abu al Fazl Abbas. And what she meant was that this is the night Abbas went as a sakka to get the water for the family. Because Imam Hussein sent him with 20 riders. They all went and they brought water on the eighth day, on the eighth night, seventh day. And the, there was so much thirst. Imam Hussein said, something must be done. There's no water at all in the, in the Khaimah. And this is what he did. And therefore, we remember him as Sakai Sakina. But I'm coming towards the end now that our Fazl Abbas went. And he was coming back with the water and the enemy was well already planning that don't let the water get to the to their tents. They already sent signals to each other. That means attack him. You know what did they do? They could not fight him. There was no way that they could have fought them with the son of Imam Ali. They cut his right hand. They cut his left hand. And then they attacked him. They hit him with a lens. They put arrows on him. And Abu Fazl Abbas <coughs> fell. He fell and the alam also fell. You know who came to know first? Sakina was standing near the Khaimah, waiting for the water to come. My brothers and sisters, remember the thirst of Sakina tonight and remember that she was waiting for the water to come. <laughs> My uncle, where is he? The alam has already fallen. It's not visible. Abu al-Fazl Abbas has called upon Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein is going and I don't want to read all the details, I just want to say that he went there and Abu al-Fazl Abbas was left on the river Euphrates, on the bank of the river Euphrates where he is buried now and Abu al-Fazl and he took the alam of Abu al-Fazl Abbas and he put it up. Sakina from the tent is seeing the alam, the alam coming. When Sakina saw the alam coming, oh, my uncle is coming. She was not aware that the father had gone. My uncle is coming. When Imam Hussein comes closer to the Khaimah, Sakina says, it's not uncle who's carrying the alam. It's his, her father carrying. Father, where is my uncle? I am me, ya abu. I am me, ya abu. And this was the situation that in Karbala, there was... Abbas was the support of everyone, the children and the women in Karbala. When Abbas fell, Bibi Zainab knew now that, that the next thing that will happen is they are going to tie the, you know, the ropes around her hands. Laylatul <laughs> Murad. Laylatul Murad. For the sake of Umm um al banin Ya Allah, listen to our prayers. Umm al banin Four sons in one hour. Four sons. Ya Allah, for the sake of Umm um al banin listen to our prayers. Let us listen to our petition, Ya Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُسْتَرَّ يَرَادَ آوَ وَيَقْشُفُ السُّورِ 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 one more time, all together. Amen, you jibul mustarada da Allah. Wa yakshifu su, ya Allah. Bihaqqi ummul banin al-tahira. Bihaqqi Fatima wa abiha wa ba'liha wa baniha. Ya Allah, bihaqqihim jami'an, ya Allah. Ya Allah, Allahumma adkhalna fi kulli khayrin. أدخلت فيه محمد وآل محمد وأخرجنا من كل سوء أخرجت منه محمد وآل محمد 
صلواتك عليه وعليهم أجبئين اللهم اشف كل مريض اللهم اشف كل مريض اللهم اشف كل مريض اللهم صد فقرنا بغناك اللهم غيسوا حالنا بحسن حالك اللهم اخز عنا الدين وأغننا من الفقر إنك على كل شيء قدير पंजा नजर जब आ गया सुकर सकीना ने कहा बे आब थे बेताब हम आया अलम आपस का सर पीट के बोले हरम अलम आपस का मातम को सब उठो बाहम अमश की जबिंते शाह का छोबे अलम से है बंदा किस शान से अहले गम आया अलम अब्बास का सर पीट के बोले हरम आया अलम अब्बास का परचम लहू से लाल है मश की जबी गिर बाल है अफजून हो क्यों कर अलम आया अलम अब्बास का सर पीट के बोले अलम आया अलम अब्बास का वाकिफ सकीना हो क्या क्या तड़प कर रोएगी अब क्यों न हो बाश में नम आया अलम आपस का सर पीट के बोले हरम आया अलम आपस का पानी बोलाए हो खाली न आए होंगे सद शुक्र आया दम में दम आया अलम आपस का सर पीट के बोले हरम आया अलम आपा ने रो रो कर कहा तू समझी है क्या जब लाए सुल्तान उमम आया अलम आपस का सर पीट के बोले मारा गया तेरा चचा जान अपनी की तुझ पर फिदा देने को दर दो रंजो हम आया 
You had mentioned the Prophet is just like us, but at the same time he's Masum. Can you please further elaborate on how we could be closer to the Prophet or how we are able to be just like the Prophet, yet he's given the special powers or special abilities? Very good question, Ali. Uh, it's uh, when we say Masum, we have mystified the term, <coughs> which in Arabic means protected from committing errors especially in the matters conveying the message of Islam and conveying the Quran and conveying what God wants him to convey. He is not to, to act on his own will, but on the will that has been clearly described in the Quran. He doesn't speak anything out of his mind, but he speaks according to the revelation. So Masum, in our own cultural understanding, Indian, Pakistani, even Iranian, by the way, we, we understand Masum as mystically someone who is sinless. We actually translate it as sinless. Whereas Isma in Arabic means protected from committing an error. It's not sinless, but committing an error. This was the difference between Sheikh Saduq and Sheikh Mufid. Sheikh Saduq said, Imams do forget. They are masoom, but they can forget because otherwise we will consider them superhumans. They are human beings. At the same time, Sheikh Mufid said, yes, but they cannot forget something that is revealed to them as part of the religion. So that's what I think we find to be the difference. Did I answer your question? So, but assume in that sense, the prophet is still an exemplary that whom we can follow as an example. He's not, that's not mystification of his role as a human being. So are you saying outside of that, he is capable or he has committed sin? No. I'm not saying that. Uh, imagine I am a professor and you say, well, you know, as a man who has spent 40 years with the books, should not be committing errors. See, oh, part of my qualification is that since I know the books for 40 years, I would not make that error. The Prophet ﷺ is chosen for a mission. His perfection is guaranteed because he's the ambassador from God's you know, own court, so to speak. So when he delivers, he delivers in the way it has to be delivered. We haven't come across records that would say, you know, that the Prophet made, committed any sins or any other, because it is his perfection as such that he would not do that. We don't expect him to commit sins because of his perfection as a human being. There are people like that that are saved living sins today also. This by my understanding is that uh, the reason why the Masums are Masum is because Allah has endowed them or provided them access to all the knowledge any that relates to any part of the universe, anything to do with human, human beings, so that they can be the most perfect example living in all times, at all times. And that is the knowledge. Because even ordinary people like us, if we know smoking is not good for us, we don't smoke. So in the case of Mansoum, this is like yeah. much higher plane. I, I must add uh, a point. I think it's a good point that you're raising. I think what, what we need to keep in mind is that Aqidah is a different issue than the historical record. Aqidah says they had no shadow. Aqidah says they could not menstruate. Aqidah says they were perfect in every instance of their existence. Aqidah is a different matter and history is a different matter. What the Quran presents are the human beings who have been perfected to the level whereby they can become exemplars. If they were not to be followed, then God would have sent the angels who would be different than us. 
Whereas what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to was Atiullah wa atiul Rasul wa alul amri minkum. You obey God and the Prophet and those who exercise authority over you. That means if they are, if they are not obeyable, then God would not command us to obey them. They are a perfect example of what they, of the office they were holding. All of the things that you mentioned are part of the aqidah, the belief system, for which we don't question too much. We just accept the belief the way they are. There's no logic to it, although. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, alaikum. Um, you previously mentioned that uh, quote from your mother, Islam. Islam was. I don't know who is quoting. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like um, to see who speaks here. Yes. So you mentioned Islam will suffer from the emptiness of content, except for rituals. Yes. So how do you go back and refill the content and today? Restore the content by reading the Quran and knowing the Ahlul Bayt the way they should be known, not mystified through strange beliefs of ours. That's not what the Imams are supposed to be. Even the prophets are not led that way. They are human beings who are perfect in example and they can be followed by us. No excuse that, oh, because they were so and so, oh, we could not do it. That's how we say it. Because we have mystified them. If Bibi Zainab is, is Bibi Zainab Masum? No. But her actions are perfect. What she did was perfect. She's not Masum. No. I will first pass Masum? No. Amar Rajalun Saleh, Imam Jafar Sadiq says, he was Saleh, my uncle was Saleh. He didn't say my uncle was Masum. I, I think we, we need to somehow come to the level of our Imams, rather than make them divine. Divine, making them divine is an insult to them. That means they did not achieve anything without God genetically making them like that. No, God did not do that. God made them born in a proper family and they were in the household where mothers were there, fathers were there, brothers and sisters were there, and they perfected themselves. Don't mystify them through the Aqidah. Aqidah simply says they must be followed. No excuse. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, in other words, Islam, I didn't say only rituals. <laughs> Did I say that? No. Islam has been emptied of its contents. What has remained with us is rituals and beliefs that my sister is mentioning. That this is what we believe in. Oh, is this Islam? Is this what the Quran says? The Quran says only one person is Masum, Only one entity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody else. Is there a belief in Isma in the Quran? No. There isn't. Is it located in, in the Hadith somewhere? No. It isn't. Where did we get it from? This is emptying Islam from its content. So that we can have excuse, I don't have to follow Islam. These were, these were perfect individuals. It really angers me, by the way. It makes me frustrated enormously. I'm very sorry and I apologize for that. Don't do that. It's an insult to our imams to say, oh, you don't have shadows. You, to say to be Fatima, you did not menstruate. How did you give birth to the children? What do you mean by saying that? And I think there is, there is a big debate going on in Najaf in Lebanon, in Beirut, and in Iran. You know that Muhammad and Fatullah believed that Fatima to Zahra did menstruate. She was like any other woman, but she was a perfect lady. All right. Now they have written books after books of attacking him. No, 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 she was not there. She, he was. It doesn't help our religion. Imam Ali is right that we have lost the content by such beliefs about our Imams and our Ayyimah Tahirin, Ahlul Bayt. We should not hold such beliefs. We should just reject them. No, they are not part of us. How to get back the content? Go back to the Quran. And I guarantee you, I'm not exaggerating. You will not find a single verse talking about Isma of the Prophets. Never. Abasa wa Tawalla is describing, is criticizing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have tried to cover it up. Tafsir we do and as if he didn't do. No, he was talking to this rich man in Meccan society and, and the Quran is striking. How did you know? The Quran is reprimanding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did you know that this blind man is no better? And you know, you are not even responding to him. 
Are you responding to the rich man? Don't we do that? I do that myself. There's a rich guy here who comes and he's the one who can be the big donor. I pay attention to him, attention to him and I don't pay attention to the poor man. I do it. And Prophet was no different in that sense. As a human being, he wanted to influence that Meccan who would become the Muslim and there will be power to the Prophet's Meccan group. And Quran says, no, Abba Sawatawalla. You frown on a blind man? How dare you do that? That's the tone of the Quran. Don't mystify the Quran. Don't do that. Open the Quran and you will learn how human beings are presented to us as exemplars. The more you mystify them, the more we are far away from their behavior. Then our behavior is something different. Any other questions? Actually, this is along the same discussion. And my understanding is that the usul adl requires that, that's why I said, Please, that, please, the knowledge, let's not waste we're our time. About the knowledge, not let's, let's not waste our time, my sister. No. Okay, thank you. The other justice of God requires us to give no excuse to us that, Ya Allah, we did not accept the Prophet because he was too perfect. Your Adala required to him to be too perfect. No, that doesn't work. Adala simply means you and I are supposed to act truthfully and morally correct. That's what Adala means, nothing more than that. Quick question, sir. Um, the question you asked in your lecture, like if you were asked by someone, what is the one redeeming trait of Islam? What is the one thing, one good thing you can say for it? How would you answer that question yourself? <laughs> yeah. Let me hear you. What would you say? Whatever you know at your age, young age, because you've impressed me. What you have done today was amazing. But I want to know, what would you say in one word? How would you capture that in one word? What did Islam teach you that makes you a human being that is fit to be part of the human community. Because sometimes we are not fit to be part of the human community. What is it? I'm a bit on the spot here. But... <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to find one word. The word yeah. would be forgiveness. <laughs> one word means one thought. Maybe a word cannot capture it, but one thought can capture it. One sentence can capture it. I think one word will be fine. Okay. The word would be mercy. 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 Ah, uh, okay. Okay, yeah. Simply as one who has submitted That's to right. a higher power yes. and who has been forgiven of their transgressions simply because they have their transgressions are minor compared to the goodness within. It's very so good. As long as very good. Yes, that yes. goodness within. Indeed, indeed. If anything, Islam has taught us to submit to the will of God. If anything, that's what it is. In my, in my assessment, one word, Islam has taught me to be truthful. No lies, no bluffing, no exaggerations. That's what I have learned from Islam. That's why I'm very daring. I'm very open. I, I punish myself. Myself. I don't, I don't hesitate to punish myself for the wrong belief that I carry. I punish myself. For days I do istighfar for that. Honesty. You should never be afraid of honesty and truthfulness. That's what Islam teaches. Because that's what one man, when he came to the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, teach me only one thing. I want to become Muslim, but I won't pray. I won't do anything. You teach me one thing. I'll follow only one thing. The Prophet said, be truthful. Sadaq. And through truthful, he learned everything else. So the foundation of religion is being truthful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other thing? Any 
Any other questions? Thank you. Towards the zero. Salam alaikum, ya Rasulullah. السلام عليك يا رسول الله ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين علي ولي الله السلام عليك يا تصدقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا أبا محمد الحسن بن علي السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله الحسين يا سيد الشهداء وعلى جميع شهداء كربلاء جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا مريم القرباء معين الضعفاء والفقراء إمام حبيب الموصر رضاكم شفيعنا وشفيع والدينا يوم 